Welcome, everybody. Um, happy to have you join. We have uh, a number of people joining us today for, for this webinar on capturing the T1D perspective in research. Um, and we're excited to um, start off uh, first with a uh, little bit of a, a brief overview, about five minutes. Uh, Dr. Wendy Wolf, uh, who runs our T1D Exchange Registry, will give just a, uh, a very short presentation on uh, some of the work that we do at T1D Exchange, but then we'll quickly move into um, a panel discussion um, absolute for the, the balance of the hour. Um, and just for your own information, you know, we have a number of people from the, uh, the T1D community, patients and caregivers, um, as well as those in industry or in some providers who, who care for people with type one, um, you know, all participating um, or in attending this, this webinar. So we're happy to, happy to have all of you and, uh, and get started with this. So I will turn it over to, to Wendy and then uh, I'll kick back the, the panel after she's done. Great, thanks Dave. Welcome everybody, thanks for joining us today. I'm going to touch on the three ways that we capture the T1D perspective at the exchange. The first is through our online community. The second is through our formal research project, the T1D Exchange Registry. And the third is through our custom research projects. So our online community is a platform for individuals living with type one and members of their support network, such as care providers and healthcare providers. And this includes over 12,000 engaged members of the community. Through this platform, participants can inform research and share with the community by answering questions of the day. They can read relevant content as well as participate in sponsored studies. Importantly, they can also connect with and learn from others who live with type one. The question of the day is really a quick way for us to take the pulse of the community on different topics. And in May, we asked the question, what is your perception regarding telehealth? Here you can see the results of that data. At that time, 46% reported that they have used it and they like it. However, given the ongoing pandemic, we decided that we also wanted to sort of check in with the community on this topic as, as time went on. And so we report, repeated the same question uh, very recently on November 30th. And we found that for a similar number of respondents, there was now a uh, 80 or 61 percent of the population had reported using telehealth and thinking it was advantageous. So this is just one example of a question of the day that we use with our online community. I should note that a number of people from our community have decided to join our formal research project, which is the registry. And the registry is a longitudinal study that seeks to create a cohort of individuals living with type one within the US. Anyone can participate at any age. And we want to make participation in research very easy. So participants in the registry can sign up for other studies in addition to ours on various topics related to type one. So in terms of these first two goals, which I just touched on, we are also gathering over time data on disease, health status, and self-reported outcomes. And the hope is to harness this information to generate evidence to support policy, insurance covered changes that can benefit the type one community. It's pretty easy to join the registry. You sign up and complete a uh, consent form as well as a 29 question survey at the time of enrollment. This captures information such as demographics like age and gender, socioeconomic data such as education and insurance information, as well as clinical information. So A1Cs, information about other health conditions as well as diabetes management approaches. 
to date, we have close to 11,000 participants in the registry and over uh, 6,700 have completed the core questionnaire at the time of enrollment. Since the study has now been operating for a little over a year, there's a subset of the cohort that have been able to complete our annual questionnaire in that we have over 800 responses to date for that first annual questionnaire. Some quick stats on the registry. We have participants from over 50 states as well as Puerto Rico and 85% of our participants are adults with the average participant age of 38. In addition, uh, people report on average living with type one for close to 21 years within the cohort. And we have a large number over 5,000 CGM users. So while we have representation from every state and every age bracket, we're actively looking to increase the diversity of the cohort particularly with respect to recruiting more males and more people of color. In addition to the registry, we conduct custom research projects on a number of topics that really sort of capture the participant voice and experience for individuals living with type one, as well as their caregivers. We use uh, a number of different methods to do this through one-on-one -on -one interviews, multi-person focus groups, surveys, and device data analysis. So these projects can be sponsored or internally initiated projects. And some of the recent topics that we've studied are outlined here. We've focused on heavily on hypoglycemia and have a project that's looking at uh, severe lows and glucagon use and that experience for people. As well, we are developing a fear of hypoglycemia screener that we are near, uh, nearly ready to pilot in clinical sites. We've also studied CGM time and range as a proxy for A1Cs. In addition, we've focused on uh, a better understanding of the impact of diabetes on daily life, sort of focusing on a number of different areas, but also touching on sleep, exercise, and aging. If you're interested in more information, please see our recent publications noted below. Finally, in summary, I just wanna say that participating in research allows people living with type one to share their voice and share their experience. If you're living with type one and if you're interested in joining the registry, please see the URL below for more information. With that, I will turn it over to Dave. Great, thanks, Wendy. Appreciate that, and um, you know that's certainly one of the, the points we want to make, and we'll hear about it. I think with the panel is that research does take many forms, and sometimes people think the only way to participate in research is to go to a doctor's office or a hospital and provide you know samples and and you know participate in that way. Versus, you know, there are a lot of activities where you can give feedback in different different forms and fashions, and and that's something that we get to be involved in a lot of those different activities and um, certainly want to make sure that uh, everyone's really uh, understands uh, the possibilities that exist. We're very excited for the, uh, the panelists today. Um, I'll have them give an intro in a, in a minute, but just as you can see, we have Brandon Denson, uh, who co-host and founder of uh, Bolus Maximus podcast and president of Bolus Maximus. I absolutely love that name. Uh, Expect nothing less from a former college football player. Uh, very strong name there. Christine Falabel, uh, living with T1D, uh, advocate, freelance writer, um, also does uh, advocacy work for the ADA. Uh, Steph Habif, uh, Vice President of Behavioral Sciences at Tandem Diabetes Care. And, and she'll talk a bit about some of her experiences there gathering feedback. And Jeff Hitchcock, uh, President of Children with Diabetes, which I, uh, many of you may be aware of the conferences and uh, a lot of the, the outreach and education that they do as well. Um, so with that, I'll uh, move to bring on the, the panelists here. If you guys can unmute yourselves and we'll go through um, and I'll you know, first start off uh, with asking each of you just to give you know, one minute summary of the work that you're currently doing and first and foremost, how it relates to type one diabetes and your connection to T1D. So we can start, um, I'll go off my tiles here. Um, maybe start with Brandon. Hello, uh, first and foremost, I wanna thank you for the opportunity to come on and uh, actually talk to your participants. 
Uh, my name is Brandon A. Denson. I've been living with type 1 diabetes for a little over 17 years now. Uh, I had an opportunity to graduate from Michigan State University, play football there. But the reason that that's that's nothing, that's not important. The important thing is that we're bringing things together within the community. Uh, I am actually the president of a nonprofit that I started with my uh, co-founder, Matthew Taro. Uh, he's also a type one diabetic and he works at Tandem Diabetes. And we also have a podcast by the name of Bolus Maximus. So please tune in anytime and streaming on all platforms. And we also have a website as well uh, at www.bolusm.org. Um, we our, our main objective is to bring the community tighter, specifically starting with males and diversifying that. But at the end of the day, we all live with this disease and we understand the complications. We understand the headache and, and the heartache that we go through, not just ourselves, but our families and our caregivers. So uh, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, Jeff. Hi, I'm Jeff Hitchcock, the founder and president of Children with Diabetes. We provide education and support to families living with type 1 diabetes, like mine. My daughter, Marissa, who is now 33 and a research nurse, was diagnosed in September of 1989 when she was 24 months old. And there were no resources at the time to really help families learn how to thrive. And, and that's what we primarily focus on. And Dave, you had alluded to our Friends for Life conferences. The most uh, well-known is our Friends for Life Orlando event held every July at Disney uh, every year except this year. Um, so we, we switched to a virtual event. But when we are together in Orlando, it's the largest family-focused type one educational event in the world with several thousand people who come together for a week of research science, fun, just hanging out at the pool kind of stuff. So we're, we're looking forward to getting back and hopefully that's in 2021. Yeah, great. Christine? Hi everyone, and thank you so much for having me today. My name is Christine Falabell and I am a health writer. I'm a, the director of state government affairs and advocacy with the American Diabetes Association. And I think most importantly, I'm a person living with type one diabetes. This past summer, I celebrated my 20th anniversary, and so pretty big milestone, and I'm honored to be here today to speak with you all. So thanks again. Thanks, Christine. And Steph. Yes, happy to bring up the rear. Hi, everybody. Happy holidays. My name is Steph Habif. I serve as the Vice President of Behavioral Sciences at Tandem Diabetes Care. Um, Jeff, it's so nice to put a face to a name. I've been to the CWD conferences a bunch and Brandon, I know Matthew. And so it's very cool to be able to have some time with you today. I'm excited to learn with everybody. In my role uh, as Vice President of Behavioral Sciences, I oversee a couple of different teams at Tandem. Uh, some of our teams are responsible for doing all of the human factors research and usability testing to ensure that the machines that we bring into the world are safe and effective to use. Um, another one of my teams is responsible for conducting all kinds of what we call post-market surveillance or observational research where once the FDA provides clearance for uh, diabetes technologies, how is that experience in the everyday lives of people and their caregivers and their family members and their healthcare providers using the machines that we make? So I like to say that our behavioral sciences team runs around advocating for the humans using the machines. <laughs> Great, thanks Steph. Well, that helps kind of provide a bridge to the kind of the first, the first question I wanted to pose to the panel. Um, if you could describe some of the, the different types of research, and again, we're, we're considering it as market research or you know, voice of customer or clinical research, um, in which you've been involved in kind of how you, you go about that and enrolling people with uh, T1D into that uh, research. I'm very happy to start that off just to keep sure. a um, kind of smooth dialogue. Um, so I think in my experience, and I'm sure this is true for a lot of people, when they hear about diabetes research, uh, automatically they think clinical trials, um, you know, and that's not true just for diabetes. I think that's true for almost all of healthcare and medical device. And certainly clinical trials are critical to making sure that uh, the latest and greatest technology can be available in our everyday lives. Um, 
But there are so many other types of research that people can participate in and get involved with outside of clinical trials, such as, you know, if you ever receive through a text message or email a survey where a company like Tandem is saying, hey, we'd love to hear about your experience. That research is fundamental to making the experiences and the machines better um, and optimized for use. Um, or in, in our case, uh, running human factors usability testing, um, the FDA requires very robust usability testing when uh, diabetes technologies are in the development stages, uh, right? It's very critical that we spend a lot of time with the people who we're designing the technologies for to ensure that um, they are intuitive and designed well. So the, ex uh, the example that I like to give around human factors of usability research is I have two children at home who are four and six years old. And so sometimes I'll bring a prototype of one of our early stage, you know, development stage machines, I'll bring it home and I'll just put it into the hands of my four-year-old or my six-year-old and just watch them. And if they can navigate the machine or if they kind of know what to do, that's an example of intuitive use, right? It's where you observe how the humans uh, interact with the machines in a very organic fashion. Um, and I'm sure for anybody else out there who has children or grandchildren, watching them use a smartphone or an iPad or anything like that is just mind blowing. <laughs> they, they seem to know what to do. So um, lots of different types of research for sure. And I look forward to talking more about that during this hour. Yeah, I, right. I, I'll piggyback on that. So at our Friends for Life conference, we give our generous sponsors like Tandem an opportunity to talk with our families in focus groups, things of that nature to get the voice of the community, our families, to help improve products, figure out how to do software better and the like. And one of the more interesting examples was many years ago, we had a glucose tablet company come and they brought about 25 flavors to test. And they decided to make the top flavors that were picked. Um, pina colada didn't win, but there were some other ones that did. So there's lots of ways to get involved like that. And one of the things that, that we also do at, at Friends for Life Orlando is we bring a team from the New Jersey School of Medicine that does free retinal screening. And it's a chance from our perspective to show how easy it is to get your eyes screened, a very important topic for people with type one but we now have about 10 years of longitudinal data from families who've come to Friends for Life and been screened year after year. And that team has published quite a bit of, uh, of research papers based on the families who come to Orlando. It's been remarkable. Wow, that's awesome. And Jeff, as someone who did attend and at, while I worked at Animus, we got some great feedback in a, uh, focus groups on the closed loop system that we were working on. And that, that input was uh, definitely valuable to think about, you know, the overnight control and the importance of that and what you know, parents were looking for uh, in particular in the system. Um, Christina, Brandon, uh, you want to describe? Yeah, and uh, just to piggyback off of what Jeff said, uh, I, I've been able to attend uh, Friends for Life, uh, Children with Diabetes amazing, amazing organization and amazing event that just brings everybody together. Uh, but what we're doing something with Bolus Maximus, we're doing something as similar to what you said about the glucose tabs. Uh, this month of December, we actually have people coming into our meeting rooms to kind of discuss um, their methods of use as far as their treatment, whether it's MDI, whether it's insulin pumps, um, you know, and to give us that, that user experience, you know, because I think without listening to the community and understanding what works and what doesn't work, it's hard to kind of create another product um, that's going to be beneficial um, as to living with this disease. So, um, you know, we always open that platform to, to we want to hear from the community because we know a, as in any business, if you're not listening to the customer or the client, then it's probably going to fail. So, you know, it, it's always good to get different perspectives, but then also just how people live their everyday life with using the technology and the insulin and things like that. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Go ahead, Christine. Yeah. And I'll also add that reaching out to the diabetes online community, especially communities on Facebook and Twitter, and really getting that feedback from 
people living with uh, diabetes is so important. Um, I think especially now that COVID has shut everything down, people can't get together in person, um, soliciting that feedback online is, is crucial. So Christina, maybe follow up on you know, specifically how research can be used to accomplish something else. And I know, you know, Steph obviously talked about product development and you can imagine all the ways that could help. But some of the work you were doing with advocacy and CGM, I believe it was Medicaid in Colorado, you were, you were telling us briefly about um, in the surveys that you did. Maybe you could share a little on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so in my work with the ADA, we supported the first copay cap payment uh, in the United States and it capped insulin copay caps to $100 per month in Colorado. Um, that passed in 2019 and it was House Bill 1216. Uh, and the bill actually had two parts. Um, the, the part that the media focused on was the copay cap because that's super exciting for people living with diabetes. But the second half enlisted the Colorado Attorney General to actually do a research study into the rising cost of insulin in Colorado. Um, and part of that research study was uh, creating a survey that went out to all Coloradans and over 400 Coloradans with diabetes responded to the survey and it asked you know, 50 or so questions on how are you affording your insulin? What are your barriers to affording insulin? Um, how has COVID affected your ability to access insulin? Um, and the feedback was just incredible. You know, we had people saying that they are traveling to Mexico and Canada, even with the copay cap bill in place. Um, some people fall outside the scope of it. They're not on a state regulated health plan. Um, people reported that they're rationing their insulin, bartering for insulin, um, borrowing insulin from family and friends. And I think it's really important that um, the researchers at the AG's office actually went out into the community and, and got this qualitative data because without having um, a survey, you would never hear these stories. And it was really powerful to get um, to get all of that feedback. So um, we're actually taking you know, that feedback to inform our legislative agenda for 2021. And one of the responses overwhelmingly was that Colorado Medicaid does not cover continuous glucose monitors. Um, they are covered for children up until age 21 under a federal program called EPSDT. Uh, and then when you hit age 21, you're taken off uh, on Colorado Medicaid and this differs by every state Medicaid program. Um, but people responded overwhelmingly saying, I need a CGM, I've been on it for 10 years, I turned 21, I'm on Colorado Medicaid and now I don't have access. And so um, that's informing you know, what we wanna prioritize in 2021. And I think without having tools um, like the survey to get this qualitative data, we wouldn't have known that the issue was such a big problem. So um, it definitely has informed my work and as a person living with T1D and I've been on a CGM for six years, I know how important it is to, to have good control. And so um, really exciting stuff. Yeah, that's great. You know, Steph, you, you uh, also talked about some, some interesting things that you uncovered in your, your research, uh, maybe with Control IQ and, and MDI users and how they you know, viewed things. Uh, maybe you could share a little bit about how some of that uh, feedback and research you've used to kind of help help you in your development and, and marketing of Control IQ? Sure, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I tell the engineers and the technologists who I work with every day how in awe I am of them and their ability to build and create things. Um, and, you know, uh, an insulin pump or a CGM, any of the technologies that we use in our community, it, that, that's a beautiful example of pure human computer interactions. So while my teams are busy focusing on the humans, they're in their labs and in their, in their rooms um, building these, um, these amazing machines and these amazing technologies. And I think in order to be really good at that, um, you have to focus. And so the beauty comes in anytime we get a chance to take one of those prototypes or one of those machines and present it for the, for the first time to the people who we're designing for. Um, and a lot of times the way we do that is we don't say very much, right? Because we just wanna see how that interaction goes, you know, whether it has to do with the way people think about the technology, the way that they want to navigate or interact with the technology. Um, and so some of the most valuable lessons we learn when we do that research is what not to design or what not to build. 
And so um, every time a new CGM or a new insulin pump or a new drug or anything like that comes to market and becomes available for our communities, there were probably many, many, many versions of that earlier on that were in some different form or format. Um, but in some of our recent clinical trials, um, again, you want to try to be as organic and observational as possible. Uh, I was telling Dave a story recently where in one of our clinical trials specifically related to control IQ for anybody who is familiar with the T-Slim X2 with control IQ, it's an advanced hybrid closed loop system. And the part that makes it advanced is that it uses the CGM readings um, to predict and to predict what's gonna happen with your blood sugars. And based on that, it can deliver auto boluses, right? Automatic boluses of insulin. Um, and so um, we had uh, one of our clinical trial participants who has, has gone out and, and talked about her experience quite a bit. When she was participating in the Control IQ clinical trial, she didn't touch the pump. She literally didn't touch it at all because she thought that's what she was supposed to do. She thought she was supposed to completely just not touch it. And at some point, you know, along the lines during the trial, when she went to go meet with the doctor and the, and the person running the research, uh, that person said, um, it, you know, is there a reason you're not touching the pump because it still requires you to bolus for meals, right? We're not quite yet in a world where it's completely hands off and you don't have to touch it at all. Um, and she said, oh, no, typically I would go to my pump and I would bolus for meals. And the doctor said, well, why aren't you doing that? And she said, oh, I didn't know. I thought I was supposed to not touch it. You know, and so that became a very critical insight for when it was time for Control IQ, the system to be introduced to the world, that it still requires you to interact a bit with the pump, especially for bolusing in order to achieve an optimal experience. Yeah, that's <laughs> fascinating. Um, you know, I'm curious around challenges that um, all of you have seen in kind of either conducting research or participating in or just observing how it's being done, uh, whether that's kind of not getting enough participation, representativeness, et cetera. Are there things that you'd, you'd point out that, that you've seen, um, you know, and, and we'll then get into kind of, is there some advice on how we could maybe do better in some of those, those areas? One of the areas where we try to bring families in is on the biological research. So not some, not specifically the device stuff, but research into prevention as an example, trial net, a, a, a specific example. And there is in the parent community an undercurrent of, of reluctance to participate. Almost, I don't wanna know because I don't know what I would do if I learned that my child was at high risk for developing type one diabetes or was already on the progression to developing type one. So for many years, we've brought TrialNet to Friends for Life conferences, especially Orlando. They bring a excellent phlebotomy team. They screen people. And I, I will get up in front of the, the crowd at the beginning of the opening keynote and remind them that all the money in the world and all the most brilliant researchers in the world can't solve this if we, the community of people living with type one don't participate. So I, I feel that there is a, an opportunity for those of us who have a voice, whether it is in person or in online and social media and the like, to remind people that, you know, the, there's people like Steph and her company who are doing great innovation, but, but we have to be there for them. We, we have to participate. That's how we get innovation. That's how we get scientific breakthroughs. That's how we do better. Yeah. You know, Jeff, that screening question, um, I worked with a lot of people who had type one and I have it myself. And uh, a number of people did not participate years ago in the screening efforts uh, for the reasons you, you described. It, there weren't treatments on the, on the horizon that they said, well, why would I just want to know this and live in, or have my family member live in, in this Doom, but obviously that's starting to change a little bit, um, given that there are some therapies coming, sure. clinical data showing that, hey, we might be able yep. to delay this. I'm curious for those uh, you know, with type one or you know, your daughter, if you're willing to, to share, has, 
Has anyone been or had family members screened, uh, immediate family members screened for, for T1D? Yeah, so we screened our other two children uh, very early on, as soon as they were able to. And Marissa had her son, Connor, screened uh, at the earliest opportunity that he could and was actually part of a trial net promotion talking about how important it is to get screened. And from th this is really about data matters, knowledge matters. Yeah. This is why CGM is important. You can't, you know, the, the more data you have, the better decision making you have. So if you know that type one is a, is a risk, you can begin to make behavioral changes to improve outcomes. And, and we know that if you catch type one before DKA, you have substantially better life, you know, long-term outcomes. So th there are, even in the absence of a, an intervention, reasons to participate in screening trials and all these other types of trials and research that are available. I will say, um, you know, being very involved in the diabetes community, I have two older brothers, neither of whom were ever tested. Um, so it just goes to show that even people who are heavily involved in diabetes, sometimes their family is intimidated or they don't prioritize it. Um, and so, you know, it's not just the people that um, aren't involved or aren't online or anything like that. I think um, it's widespread. And so um, definitely sharing the importance of signing up and I will be getting on my brother's backs to get tested. <laughs> Good for you. And I, I'll, I'll, and I, I want to just jump in there too, as well. I, I'll say that, that sometimes the biggest problem is or issue is like Jeff mentioned, is that we have family members that are like, I don't know what I would do if I had it. I don't know if I could handle that, what you go through. But as, as we are our best advocates, but we're also our advocates for our family and our friends and our community members, the best thing that we can do is how we thrive with this disease is to tell them that if you do have it, you're gonna be okay. You know, so anytime I hear somebody say, I don't know, I don't know, I don't think I can handle what you go through. But at the end of the day, like you got a shoulder to lean on, you have a yeah. community of people to where they can help you out. No matter how tough you may think it is, it's better to put yourself in a situation to get screened, to get tested. So you're not in a DK situation or possibly dead. Yeah. Well, to that point about having a shoulder, you know, as you mentioned, I mean, it was pretty interesting when we talked about this, you know, we asked, you know, did you know anyone else growing up with uh, T1D? Right. And I think you you said you went you went a little bit of time before you met someone. So so I'm glad that you brought that up, because that's very important to why I'm probably even in front of you talking to you and all the participants as well. And I went when I was diagnosed at 17, uh, I grew up in Ypsilanti, Michigan. I went to Willowrunner High School and I didn't I didn't know I didn't know anybody that had type one diabetes and specifically in my school, you know, so I was making that transition of going from my senior year, going into my senior year of high school. I had a lot of things on my plate, you know, getting ready for college, you know, what college was I going to go to things like that. I knew I still had dreams and ambitions on playing collegiate football division one. And when I got to Michigan state, it was like, man, I'm here. I'm isolated again, you know, starting a new, uh, starting a new, I, I want to say career because, you know, I looked at it as a career and, and, and I didn't know anybody that had type one diabetes. Well, I take that back. I knew a volleyball player, but she ended up transferring. So I was like, man, what am I going to do? But I had a kid write me a letter by the name of Nate Bob and he's actually a CDCES now. And I, I t I've told this story over and over again. If it wasn't for him, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you because him and his family seeked me out and they opened me up to the community to realize like, I'm not the only one that has this disease. You know, so I know as people living in, in urban areas, that's living in rural areas, just understand that there is a community out there for you. And the diabetes community is probably one of the most resilient communities that I've ever seen in my entire life. Yeah. And then one of the things we like to do is collaborate and plug other organizations. So obviously Jeff's organization does, does a lot for families and connecting people and they can relate to others. Uh, college Diabetes Network is an organization that can help when people go to college and you're feeling isolated, it'd be good to connect with someone else you know, on campus. Um, you know, and obviously with screening and the things that JDRF is now doing with T1 Detect and other organizations looking to do that as well. And, will probably be playing a, a part in helping the cause around that. So uh, definitely takes 
takes a village to, to kind of work on that. Um, you know, are, are there um, things that you guys think should be studied more in research that you don't hear about? Like, what, why isn't that a topic that someone is doing, whether it's someone making a product or, um, you know, providers trying to understand what patients go through, whatever the case may be. Um, are there anything that come to mind from any of you that you, you wish people would, would, you know, research that a topic more? Yeah, I think um, with type one in specific, uh, there's a large focus on children and that's amazing. And children and families need, you know, some of the most support. But then uh, like Brandon was saying, there's this whole cohort of kids that are 17, 18, 19, 20 and are being diagnosed and they're out of high school and, you know, maybe they've aged out of diabetes camp that saved my life until I was in my, you know, young 20s. Um, and then, you know, in your twenties and thirties, there's this, you know, kids with type one grow up and there's this whole notion, I think in the general public that juvenile diabetes might go away. Um, but there's millions of us out there that are in our thirties now married, you know, considering having children and what does type one in pregnancy look like, or what does support for type one look like after you graduate college? And there's not a college diabetes network support group there. Um, what happens when you move away from home to a new city for the first time and no one at your new job knows you have type one. Um, and so I think there's a whole area of research and it is getting better. I think, um, you know, it's being studied more and people are raising their voices more than ever before. But I think, um, you know, kids with type one grow up and I think that support is needed all the way through um, the whole lifespan. So, yeah, I, I would also share a little bit on how the programming at our conferences has changed over the last say five or six years and what that reflects. So years and years ago, a lot of our programming was about the mechanics of living with type one. How do you maximize MDI? How do you get the most out of your pumps? And in recent years, the innovation on the device space has been spectacular. So it's much easier to use thanks to people like Steph and her team and the families who participate. And we've come to realize that what, what people really want is the psychosocial support, kind of like what Christine was talking about. How do I thrive with type one? How do I be a responsible partner to an adult with type one? How do I become a parent? How do I talk with my kids? And that's I think where the real, the gap is today. Um, we know there's a lot of research underway. Uh, and we know a lot of uh, psychologists in the space, but that's, I think, where our families need the most help. How do I, how do I stay in this game that I, I you know, to, Brandon, to, to use a football metaphor, I can't get off the field and I can never cross the goal line, but I got to keep playing. So how do I stay motivated? How do I stay in? How do I stay involved? Because we know if you do that, you have good outcomes. So the, the psychosocial research, I think, is where we're going to see great opportunity to have really profound impact on people's lives. We, um, we know, it, you know, it's a scientific fact that social support mitigates stress. And I think we can all relate to the fact that this year in particular has given us this firsthand experience that when we get when we don't get to be with each other in person it's it's not the same and and god bless technology thank god for you know these tools like zoom and and everything to keep us connected um but uh as far as you know the mitigation of stress and jeff to to, to, to build on what you were saying the relief of burden and you know, how do we collectively help to carry the load um, that comes along with living with type one? There are a couple of specific um, areas of, of research that we're focused on right now. Um, one that uh, I think is, is, is critical and could potentially play a role in some of what Christine talked about related to either reimbursement changes or policy changes for us is around sleep. Um, and making sure we, we do much better at measuring, quantifying, uh, relaying evidence around sleep and, and how technologies can either help with quantity or quality of sleep and why that matters in the big picture holistically for a person and a family's health. Um, another that's 
core to my heart is related to um, trust, whether it's trust in the healthcare system, trust in uh, companies like Tandem. If you know, if if you don't trust uh, that we are upstanding and going to do what we say we're going to do, you're not going to come join research with us. You're not going to participate in in any of these efforts to try to really push the innovation. And then I would love to see more focus on things like language and cultural barriers. So we know that type one diabetes primarily impacts people who are white and Caucasian, but the incidence rates are changing. And so the type one diabetes community from an ethnic perspective is gonna look very different in the very near term, it's, it already is. Um, and so oftentimes, for example, people from the Latin, Latino, Latina, Latinx community, maybe they're not participating because of a language barrier. It has to do with the fact that English is not a first language. Um, and those are things that we can modify. You know, if we understand that the reason people aren't trusting or the reason they're not participating or the reason they can't get access has to do with language or cultural issues, we can design around that. Um, and so that's gonna be really critical work. It's long overdue um, to make sure that we can be better about reaching communities that to date have been underserved for these socioeconomic and psychosocial reasons. And, and I, I would like to piggyback off that too. I think you uh, have some valid, very valid points and you too, Jeff. Um, the, I think one of the the biggest problems that that we see is that we we think that these communities aren't coming out, um, you know, to to get help. But it's not their job to come out and to find the help. It's our jobs as organizations to go find and seek them uh, from companies uh, as Tandem, as Dexcom, as Freestyle Libre, um, as JDRF, as TCOYD, uh, as ADA. We can't assume that these people know that these organizations are in place. We have to go find them. You can't play a game of hide and seek and expect to find somebody without actually seeking for them. You know, so I think we've known and, and we've seen a problem for a very long time. Now it's time to execute. I'm going to go to football X's and O's. I know the playbook. I know what's going on. I know the stats. Now let's go execute. And I think it takes everybody in this space to collectively work together and, and execute the problem so we can all, so we can solve it because what we see is a lack of trust in primary care physicians, endocrinologists, and we also see that the time, the time on task, uh, when these individuals from co different cultural backgrounds or different dem demographics, the time that they're able to spend and get educated on what's going on. The data is the data. That's great. You can have, you can have a boatload of data, but if you don't have that data broken down, uh, far as to if, I, if my time is in range or it's not in range or from it being that the time is in range, but what am I eating that that's keeping my time in range? So I think the education piece from not just from a, a healthcare provider perspective, but also from a company perspective and from an organization is we can't play that we don't know what the problem is. We have to fix the problem. And, you know, I could go on and on about it, but at the end of the day, we have to go seek these individuals. There is no more. And I know COVID is an exception to what's going on right now. But if you're saying that you can't find these individuals and in these different demographics, then I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of, I'm going to test you on that because with me starting and in, in my, in my co-founder starting a, a nonprofit organization, it's 2020. I can connect to somebody in Africa by just getting on a call. So now what, 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 what we have to look at is that we have to put the burden on our shoulders as organizations and companies, and we have to go do better by the people, period. Yeah. Yeah, I would love, oh God, I could talk about this forever, but I'll just, I'll just quickly say, um, you're absolutely right. Every organization um, in the community needs to be better about connecting with the people that we are responsible for serving. Um, it is certainly not a diabetes specific challenge. I know that we've all been paying attention to COVID-19, obviously, and, you know, is there going to be a vaccine? And some of the most prominent stories that have come out the past couple of weeks have been around the fact that several of these vaccine trials have stalled and have had to stop because they cannot find or they don't know how to, they say they don't know how to find the people that need to participate in these clinical trials in order to ensure 
that we're designing effectively for everybody who needs it. And I think that's a commentary on, um, on, on where certainly research organizations are to date in being effective at connecting with people. And so to your point, bias for action, go to the communities, go to the diabetes camps, go to the churches, go to the places where people are, um, rather than you know sitting back and saying, well, I can't find them, so I don't know how to include them in my research. We can't say that anymore. Yeah, no, absolutely. And you know, one thing with our registry I'd point out, um, you know, we, we have data and it, it suggests that we're not doing as well as we should be um, in, in trying to reach people of color and include them in our registry. And um, you know, we're fortunate that we have a couple of people, a few people who work at, at T1D Exchange who are you know, people of color and have type one um, working on some of this. We've done focus groups with uh, people to understand why did you join uh, and what could we do better to try and you know, be something that more people want to access and be a part of. Um, so we certainly haven't solved it yet, but we're definitely working on it. I'm very you know, curious and Good to hear some of your, what you just mentioned, Brandon, about you know specific things that those who are recruiting. Because I was at a conference on Monday, and the same topic came up um, uh, about how to improve uh, kind of recruitment um, and, and conducting clinical trials. Was that purview? But in general, I'm curious if there are anything specific that's either worked or people have seen that other organizations have done um, that all of us can kind of learn from. You know, are, are there things that that could Im improve the situation? I'll, 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 I'll chime in real quick. Uh, I just recently, and I totally forgot to, to, to say this in, in my title, I actually just took a position uh, with AMCR uh, as, as a diversity program uh, community engagement specialist. And, you know, the focus is mainly to get, get to these different communities that we've been a, we, we, we haven't been able to successfully get to. And, you know, we talk about research that comes from actually being in a clinical trial to getting data or to just hosting a support group and, and hearing out other individuals. I had the opportunity after 17 years of getting involved in a trial and am I, am I gonna lie and say like, I didn't know what to expect? No, I, did, I didn't know what to expect. But the thing is, it, it gave me a different perspective on being able to see how much work and dedication comes in from, from doctors and that comes in from the patient that's actually trying the trial and actually being able to trust. Um, you know, I think a lot of times we, we, we look at it like, why won't, why can't we reach these communities? Why can't we reach these demographics? There's a history that goes along with this. And I don't know if you guys know about the Tuskegee syphilis uh, experiment, but you got to think that's not just one situation that, that, that I, and I'm going to speak for black people that have black people have been in. So you have to see that there's trauma that goes with that, you know, hearing about that and, and this is diabetes related or non-diabetes related, you got to understand where people from these backgrounds come from on just saying, I'm just going to trust that and allow that to happen. But what we have to understand is when we get into these communities and we build that trust, we can never break that trust because then you're going to have the same thing. It's going to be a ripple effect of what's going on now. You know, am, am I going to say, just go ahead, get involved in a clinical trial. I think mentally you have to be prepared because that is something that is very, is, is very intrusive depending on what type of study that you're being involved in. But what I will say is if we don't have people from those specific backgrounds, then it's going to be hard to shape things that those that those demographics or those backgrounds need far from a cultural perspective and just for living there, being able to live their best life, because we don't have we're not covering data from everybody. It's only one from one specific targeted group. Yeah. You know, we've got a, a number of people with with, you know, T1D or family members, you know, uh, listening to this webinar. Um, Curious if there is any advice you would give, and we've hit on this a little bit, but just maybe in a more direct way um, about how they could even go about getting involved in research and what doesn't require a lot of effort. And obviously T1D Exchange and the registry, we talked about that up front. Um, we think that's a great, a great place, but what other you know, avenues or you know, mechanisms could would anyone recommend to someone um, who may want to get involved but doesn't know how or where to start? 
I think a great place to start is just um, talking with your endocrinologist or even your family doctor. So I'm very fortunate. Uh, I live in Denver, Colorado, and I go to the Barbara Davis Center, um, and they are heavily involved in clinical trials. But um, when I first started going to the clinic, I filled out a form basically saying whenever there's a clinical trial that I might be eligible for, I get an automatic email, and then you can opt in very easily. Um, and I, I, I know not all clinics are like that, but I think, you know, starting the conversation with your endocrinologist and just saying that you're interested is a, a good place to start. Yeah, we recommend that too. But the flip side of that is for those participants who are clinicians and who conduct research, I, I, would, I would encourage you to ask every family that you see, are you interested? Here's stuff that's coming. Don't assume that a particular family might not be interested. Um, give everyone an opportunity to participate. And, and I think uh, you, both of you are absolutely correct. I think the biggest thing that I've learned out of uh, everything going on in our world today is, is completely turned upside down and that's okay. I mean, I'm not, I, I don't like what's going on, but you know, I think when we're faced with adversity, we have to adjust. We have to figure out how, how do we still take care of everybody in the community, everybody from our family to our friends, to our neighbors. And when I look at it is we have to, we have to, we have to be conscious and understand that we all have to work together, no matter what the, 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 it doesn't matter if you're black, if you're Arab, if you're white, if you're Asian, if you're Hispanic, it doesn't matter because what this has showed us is that we all live with the same disease and we all carry that burden. And, and, and it's tough as hell. It's tough as hell. I'm not going to say it's easy, but if we can work together, because it doesn't matter how much money you have, if you're rich or you're very wealthy and somebody is in the ghetto and they live in the hood, they still go through the same things. If not, they probably go through more. So we have to bridge this gap and work together from organization to company to company. We have to, we have to put the bottom line is that it's about the community. It's not about a dollar. It's not, it's not about who raises the most money. It's not about who gets first to a cure. It's about getting involved in registries, something as simple as that, that's not invasive, that's not intrusive to where you can just, you can hop on a computer, you can fill out a survey and you can get involved and your voice can be heard. From, from actually getting involved in trials. But we have to be connected from organizations to diabetic, to, to endocrinology offices, all the way down to primary care physicians and, and, and family health centers. Like this, this, this problem, we have to start from the ground up, not the top down. And yeah. once we start to do that and spread that web across the bottom, from, from a grassroots level, then we can begin to, to, to bridge this gap and bring this foundation all the way up like it should be. If we continue to work from the top down, then we're gonna continue to get the same results, but we have to be on the same page from endocrinologist office, from podiatrist op offices, to ophthalmology offices, to, 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 to mental health offices. We all have to be on the same page in every neighborhood, in every demographic, it doesn't matter if you have a hundred million dollars or, or, or you, or you make $20,000 a year or, or not even that. This is, this is how we're going to actually bring everything together. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, because I'm a behavioral scientist, I'll just take everything that everybody said and strip it down to one thing. If you think you're somebody who's interested in participating in research, you can go to whatever the nearest place is that you have somebody who you want to tell, whether it's a Facebook group, to Christine's point, you're on Facebook or social media, you can literally just post, I want to participate in research. And because this community is so amazing and there's so much energy in the type one community, somebody somewhere will see that and shepherd you along. Or you can write a note to T1D Exchange and raise your hand and say, hi, T1D Exchange, I want to participate in research. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, random quick question. Uh, we didn't talk about this, but if, if you were to guess how many type one diabetes clinical trials are on are active or recruiting on clinicaltrials.gov, panelists, how many would you guess there are? Just throw out a number. 11. 150. I was gonna say are you since 
Are you saying sites, actual sites, or how many studies are? Oh, sorry. Like how many studies if you search type one diabetes? Oh, okay, okay. Ooh. Staff, That's don't Google it now. Just kidding. I'm not going to answer. I'm not. I'm not getting. I'm not. I'm not. I'm okay. not. Well, I'll tell you because I had, we had no idea. We did it for fun. And 592. Wow. Um, and to your point, Jeff, um, there are a number of them that are trying to get just basic information where it's not necessarily a, a treatment that's ready, that they're trying to understand some things. Now, that's just the clinical trials. Now, think about everyone who's trying to get surveys or feedback. You know, we, we talked to a number of people about just telemedicine, trying to understand how telemedicine has impacted people with type 1. And I'll make a plug, you know, next Thursday, we are doing another uh, webinar uh, with several panelists to talk about virtual care and how that's impacting type one. But we've gotten multiple requests to field a survey to our registry participants about it. And we've already conducted a couple of them. So um, I, I was floored by that. So I was curious to see what people thought because that is a lot of studies and a lot of them are having trouble recruiting. So I think all of us, if we can amplify that that message that we need hey, more Dave, can I ask you a question? If you don't mind, sorry to cut you off. Have you ever uh, participated in, in a clinical trial? Um, I uh, didn't meet inclusion criteria for one that I tried. Um, but in general, I think over the course, and I've had 25 years of, of type one, so I was a little later when I got diagnosed. Uh, I, I didn't always know where to start. And if you didn't live near a center, um, yeah, I wasn't sure what to do. I looked in the trial net years ago and I, I wasn't close to a site where you could give the sample uh, for my child. Now they have at-home kits. So I uh, sent away for one and my daughter uh, tested and no, no antibody. So, um, you know, we, we were very happy about that, but I, did, I stumbled upon that. I didn't realize that was there. So there are so much out there that a lot of us don't know and, um, you know, I think the more we can communicate for each other and, and help enable others to get the word out, you know, the better, because there's a lot to do. Uh, we just have two minutes left in, in, the, um, in the panel. So just any closing remarks, uh, I'll just open it up, uh, you know, to anybody, if there's anything you'd just like to, to wrap up with here uh, on the topic. I would like to thank you and the exchange for the incredible work that you do. Uh, helping us all understand the lived experience of type one. And I think that's really important. And to the participants, I would like to thank all of you for making a difference in the lives of our families, whether you are clinicians who help us day to day or researchers working on improving our care and outcomes, I salute you. I, I would like to say thank you for uh, awarding me the opportunity to come on here and join these tremendous guests Christine, Jeff, Steph, Dave, yourself. Um, and at the end of the day, like I said, if you don't get anything from, from this, just understand that the research is very important from a clinical perspective, from a data perspective. And you know, this is how we're gonna continue to bridge this gap. Understand that we are our best advocate. You know, So if somebody says that you don't know something or you don't understand, there's a, there's a community out there that you can connect with. There are doctors that you can connect with, endocrinologists, PCPs. You, you can connect with so many different people and no one can tell you how you feel living with your disease because it's your disease. So always remember you're your best advocate. And the only way that we can actually bridge this gap together is to work together collectively and take any biases that you have, whether it's money, whether it's race, um, whether it's who you are, uh, we have to take all of that out and understand that the only way we're gonna get across the goal line eventually is to work together. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I would just like to echo everyone's comments and say thank you so much. Um, and if you're living with type one and you're on this webinar, know that you're not alone and your voice matters. And one way to amplify your voice is to participate in research. So thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I'm very grateful to be a part of the group like this and those listening and everybody else to continue to spend each day making the lives of people with diabetes better. So yeah. thank you for that. Thank you all panelists. It was great insight from different perspectives. Really appreciate it. And um, if anyone has any questions that they've been listening, you can, um, uh, you can message uh, info at t1dexchange.org. Um, and we're certainly t1dregistry.org uh, uh, to find out more information about joining that. So once again, thank you all and uh, appreciate it and have a good rest of your day.